Section 11 of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. Sand. Chapter 3. For some days Henriot saw little of the man who came from Birmingham, and pushed curiosity to a climax by asking for a compass in the middle of the night. For one thing he was a good deal with his friends upon the other side of Helouan, and for another he slept several nights in the desert. He loved the gigantic peace the desert gave him. The world was forgotten there, and not the world merely, but all memory of it. Everything faded out. The soul turned inwards upon itself. An Arab boy and donkey took out sleeping-bag, food, and water to the Wadi Hof, a desolate gorge about an hour eastward. It winds between cliffs whose summits rise some thousand feet above the sea. It opened suddenly, cut deep, into the swaying world of level plateau and undulating hills. It moves about, too. He never found it in the same place twice, like an arm of the desert that shifted with the changing lights. Here he watched dawns and sunsets, slept through the midday heat, and enjoyed the unearthly colouring that swept day and night across huge horizons. In solitude the desert soaked down into him. At night the jackals cried in the darkness round his cautiously fed campfire, small because wood had to be carried, and in the daytime kites circled overhead to inspect him, and an occasional white vulture flapped across the blue. The weird desolation of this rocky valley, he thought, was like the scenery of the moon. He took no watch with him, and the arrival of the donkey boy an hour after sunrise came almost from another planet, bringing things of time and common life out of some distant gulf where they had lain forgotten among lost ages. The short hour of twilight brought, too, a bewitchment into the silence that was a little less than comfortable. Full light or darkness he could manage, but this time of half-things made him want to shut his eyes and hide. Its effect stepped over imagination. The mind got lost. He could not understand it. For the cliffs and boulders of discoloured limestone shone then with an inward glow that signalled to the desert with veiled lanterns. The misshapen hills, carved by wind and rain into ominous outlines, stirred and nodded. In the morning light they retired into themselves asleep, but at dusk the tide retreated, they rose from the sea, emerging naked, threatening. They ran together and joined shoulders, the entire army of them, and the glow of their sandy bodies, self-luminous, continued even beneath the stars. Only the moonlight drowned it, for the moonrise over the Mokhtam hills brought a white, grand loveliness that drenched the entire desert. It drew a marvellous sweetness from the sand. It shone across a world as yet unfinished, whereon no life might show itself for ages yet to come. He was alone then upon an empty star before the creation of things that breathed and moved. What impressed him, however, more than everything else was the enormous vitality that rose out of all this apparent death. There was no hint of the melancholy that belongs commonly to flatness. The sadness of wide, monotonous landscape was not here. The endless repetition of sweeping vale and plateau brought infinity with measurable comprehension. He grasped a definite meaning in the phrase, "'World without end,' The desert had no end and no beginning. It gave him a sense of eternal peace, the silent peace that starfields know. Instead of subduing the soul with bewilderment, it inspired with courage, confidence, hope. Through this sand, which was the wreck of countless geological ages, rushed life that was terrific and uplifting, too huge to include melancholy, too deep to betray itself in movement. Here was the stillness of eternity— Behind the spread grey mask of apparent death lay stores of accumulated life, ready to break forth at any point. In the desert he felt himself absolutely royal. And this contrast of life, veiling itself in death, was a contradiction that somehow intoxicated. The desert exhilaration never left him. He was never alone. A companionship of millions went with him, and he felt the desert close, as stars are close to one another, or grains of sand. It was the cumasin, the hot wind bringing sand, that drove him in, with the feeling that these few days and nights had been immeasurable, and that he had been away a thousand years. He came back with the magic of the desert in his blood, hotel life tasteless and insipid by comparison. To human impressions, thus, he was fresh and vividly sensitive. His being, cleaned and sensitized by pure grandeur, 
felt people, for a time at any rate, with an uncommon sharpness of receptive judgment. He returned to a life somehow mean and meagre, resuming insignificance with his dinner jacket. Out with the sand he had been regal, now, like a slave, he strutted self-conscious and reduced. But this imperial standard of the desert stayed a little time beside him, its purity focusing judgment like a lens. The speck of smaller emotions left it clear at first, and as his eye wandered vaguely over the people assembled in the dining-room, it was arrested with a vivid shock upon two figures at the little table facing him. He had forgotten Vance, the Birmingham man who sought the north at midnight with a pocket-compass. He now saw him again, with an intuitive discernment entirely fresh, before memory brought up her clouding association, some brilliance flashed a light upon him. That man, Henriot thought, might have come with me. He would have understood and loved it. But the thought was really this, a moment's reflection spread it rather. He belongs somewhere in the desert. The desert brought him out here. And again, hidden swiftly behind it like a movement running below water. What does he want with it? What is the deeper motive he conceals? For there is a deeper motive, and it is concealed. But it was the woman seated next to him who absorbed his attention, really. Even while this thought flashed and went its way, the empty chair was occupied at last. Unlike his first encounter with the man, she looked straight at him. Their eyes met fully. For several seconds there was steady, mutual inspection, while her penetrating stare, intent without being rude, passed searchingly all over his face. It was disconcerting. Crumbling his bread, he looked equally hard at her, unable to turn away, determined not to be the first to shift his gaze. And when at length she lowered her eyes, he felt that many things had happened, as in a long period of intimate conversation. Her mind had judged him through and through. Questions and answers flashed. They were no longer strangers. For the rest of dinner, though, he was careful to avoid direct inspection. He was aware that she felt his presence and was secretly speaking with him. She asked questions beneath her breath. The answers rose with the quickened pulses in his blood. Moreover, she explained Richard Vance. It was this woman's power that Sean reflected in the man. She was the one who knew the big, unusual things. Vance merely echoed the rush of her vital personality. This was the first impression that he got, from the most striking, curious face he had ever seen in a woman. It remained very near to him all through the meal. She had moved to his table— it seemed she sat beside him. Their minds certainly knew contact from that moment. It is never difficult to credit strangers with the qualities and knowledge that one's self craves for, and no doubt Henriot's active fancy went busily to work. But nonetheless this thing remained and grew, that this woman was aware of the hidden things of Egypt he had always longed to know. There was knowledge and guidance she could impart. Her soul was searching among ancient things, her face brought the desert back into his thoughts, and with it came the sand. Here was the flash, the sight of her restored the peace and splendour he had left behind him in his desert camps. The rest, of course, was what his imagination constructed upon this slender basis, only not all of it was imagination. Now, Henriot knew little enough of women, he had no pose of understanding them, his experience was of the slightest. The love and veneration felt for his own mother had set the entire sex upon the heights. His affairs with women, if so they may be called, had been transient, all but those of early youth, which, having never known the devastating test of fulfilment, still remained ideal and superb. There was unconscious humour in his attitude from a distance, for he regarded women with wonder and respect, as puzzles that sweetened but complicated life might even endanger it. He was certainly not a marrying man, but now, as he felt the presence of this woman so deliberately possess him, there came over him two clear, strong messages, each vivid with certainty. One was that banal suggestion of familiarity claimed by lovers and the like. He had often heard of it. I have known that woman before. I have met her ages ago somewhere. She is strangely familiar to me. And the other, growing out of it almost... Have nothing to do with her. She will bring you trouble and confusion. Avoid her and be warned. In fact, a distinct presentiment. Yet, although Henriot dismissed both impressions of having no shred of evidence to justify them, the original clear judgment, as he studied her extraordinary countenance, persisted through all denials. The familiarity and the presentiment remained. There also remained this other, 
an enormous imaginative leap, that she could teach him Egypt. He watched her carefully, in a sense fascinated. He could only describe the face as black, so dark it was with the darkness of great age. Elderly was the obvious natural word, but elderly described the features only. The expression of the face wore centuries. Nor was it merely the coal-black eyes that betrayed an ancient age-travelled soul behind them. The entire presentiment mysteriously conveyed it. This woman's heart knew long-forgotten things. The thought kept beating up against him. There were cheekbones, oddly high, that made him think involuntarily of the well-advertised pharaoh Ramesses, a square, deep jaw, and an aquiline nose that gave the final touch of power. For the power undeniably was there, and while the general effect had a grimness in it, there was neither harshness nor any forbidding touch about it. There was an implacable sternness in the set of lips and jaw, and most curiously of all the eyelids over the steady eyes of black were level as a ruler. This level framing made the woman's stare remarkable beyond description. Henriot thought of an idol carved in stone, stone hard and black, with eyes that stared across the sand into a world of things non-human, very far away, forgotten of men. The face was finely ugly. This strange dark beauty flashed flame about it. And, as the way ever was with him, Henriot next fell to constructing the possible lives of herself and her companion, though without much success. Imagination soon stopped dead. She was not old enough to be Vance's mother, and assuredly she was not his wife. His interest was more than merely piqued, it was puzzled uncommonly. What was the contrast that made the man seem beside her vile? Whence came, too, the impression that she exercised some strong authority, though never directly exercised, that held him at her mercy? How did he guess that the man resented it, yet did not dare oppose— and that, apparently acquiescing good-humouredly, his will was deliberately held in abeyance, and that he waited sulkily, biding his time. There was a furtiveness in every gesture and expression. A hidden motive lurked in him, unworthiness somewhere. He was determined yet ashamed. He watched her ceaselessly, and with such uncanny closeness. Henriot imagined he divined all this. He leaped to the guess that his expenses were being paid. A good deal more was being paid besides. She was a rich relation from whom he had expectations. He was serving his seven years, ashamed of his servitude, ever calculating escape, but perhaps no ordinary escape. A faint shudder ran over him. He drew in the reins of imagination. Of course, the probabilities were that he was hopelessly astray. One usually is on such occasions, but this time, it so happened, he was singularly right. Before one thing only, his ready invention stopped every time. This vileness, this notion of unworthiness in Vance, could not be negative merely. A man with that face was no inactive weakling. The motive he was at such pains to conceal, betraying its existence by that very fact, moved surely towards aggressive action. Disguised, it never slept. Vance was sharply on the alert. He had a plan deep out of sight, and Henry remembered how the man's soft approach along the carpeted corridor had made him start— he recalled the quasi-shock it gave him. He thought again of the feeling of discomfort he had experienced. Next, his eager fancy sought to plumb the business these two had together in Egypt, in the desert. For the desert, he felt convinced, had brought them out. But here, though he constructed numerous explanations, another barrier stopped him. Because he knew. This woman was in touch with that aspect of ancient Egypt he himself had ever sought in vain— and not merely with stones the sand had buried so deep, but with the meanings they once represented, buried so utterly by the sands of later thought. And here, being ignorant, he found no clue that could lead to any satisfactory result, for he possessed no knowledge that might guide him. He floundered, until fate helped him. And the instant fate helped him, the warning and presentiment he had dismissed as fanciful became real again. He hesitated, caution acted. He would think twice before taking steps to form acquaintance. Better not, thought whispered. Better leave them alone, this queer couple. They're after things that won't do you any good. This idea of mischief, almost of danger in their purposes, was oddly insistent. For what could possibly convey it? But while he hesitated, fate, who sent the warning, pushed him at the same time into the circle of their lives. At first, tentatively, he might still have escaped— 
but soon urgently curiosity led him inexorably towards the end. End of chapter 3 of Sand